Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Len Bartoshevitz. I'm the current president of the Kent County Dental Society. And on behalf of our board, which is Brad Robinson, the VP, Taryn Wheel, our secretary, and Lexi Gallagher, we're happy to have you join us for the second seminar of our uh, program year. We're very fortunate to have three wonderful people from uh, NDX with us. We have our speaker, of course, Brenda Kirkin. We have um, Tracy Barrett, who's the territory sales manager, and also Jessica Respondek, who's going to be, uh, who's the education manager, and she's going to be going over the housekeeping rules before we begin our seminar. So I'm going to give it off to Jessica. Hi, everybody. So I'm Jessica Respondek, your education manager here at National Dentex, and your behind the scenes support. So if you need any assistance um, as the presentation goes along, feel free to message in the chat box if you're online or if you get or something happens and you're offline, please feel free to email ndxeducation at nationaldentex.com. Um, so welcome to the webinar, The Circle of Digital Dentistry, Acquisition, Fabrication, and Insertion. It is going to be presented by uh, Brenda Kirkin. And with that, I hand the reins over to Dr. Lynn. Okay, we're very fortunate, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, who is Brenda Kirkin. This evening, Brenda is a IOS clinical training specialist supporting the Midwestern Territory and region for NDX. Brenda has served in dentistry for more than 25 years and holds credentials as both a CDA and an RDA with expanded functions in the state of Michigan. Prior to joining NDX, she taught as an adjunct instructor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry in the Division of Clinical and Restorative Dentistry, where she worked in technology integration, teaching DS3 and DS4 students on the clinical floor with active patients, and also introducing the DS1 and DS2 students to intraoral scanning in the simulation lab. Brenda is experienced in all areas of four-handed dentistry and has taught throughout the United States and Canada, training dental team members in such areas as impression techniques, the retraction cord placement, provisionals, and photography. She has accumulated more than 3,000 continuing education credits and holds numerous cer certifications. And as time permits, she continues uh, even assisting chairside actively through a military dental contractor. She comes from Clarkston, Michigan. So I know if we're all live, we'd give her a big rounding, uh, rousing round of applause. But just to, I will just give her a little clap and say, welcome, Brenda. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Jessica. Um, to begin with, I have to have my presenter disclosure. I am a full-time employee of NDX and I am not getting any financial support through um, any of the scanning companies. So that part, <laughs> I just have to disclose that. And today is the circle of digital dentistry. Um, so it used to be that we are almost into the digital age. We've been there for a while. Um, I don't know how many of you, I guess, give me the thumbs up that have scanners in your office. And maybe in the chat, write what kind, but we're going to kind of go over the reasons why you would want to. <laughs> yeah, I have one thumbs up. <laughs> so one scanner, <laughs> not just teasing. Um so the course overview is what we're saying that technology is quickly changing um, and you can also change analog into digital through the lab. So if you do not have a scanner at this time, you can always make it a digital workflow. And as we go through the PowerPoint, we can go through that, but... Um, your learning objectives are why, what are the five reasons to take digital impressions? We know this day and age that it's more accurate. Um, and I come from the dental school and I had to keep a list of how many remakes we had on the digital side versus how many remakes on the analog side. And there were much more remakes with the analog side. However, you know, I did see people holding the trays wrong. I've seen <laughs> that, you know, they didn't bleed the new PVS, so it was mixed improperly. Um, 
So there's a lot of distortion, as we know. Um, and we're going to talk about best scanning practices. And the really hot topic now is um, the reference denture workflow. Um, I don't know, show of thumbs, how many have scanned a totally edentulous patient with their scanner and about how hard and difficult that is, right? Um, so I'm going to show you a better workflow that makes it easier on both whoever's scanning, may it be the RDA, yourself, and of course the patient. So I am a team of three. Kelly is our director and she comes from Pennsylvania. Brittany is a RDH and she is the IOS specialist for the Western region. She is from Arizona. And then of course you have me, Michigan, the Midwest area. And this is a little bit about that Dr. Lynn already went through. So we have a lot of different resources at NDX. Um, we have blogs, we have past webinars. So please utilize those. And, you know, we've done a lot of webinars on different scanners like the iTero, the Trios. So if you're ever in a little pickle, want to look at that, we've gone over a lot of difficult cases and little tips and tricks. Here's the five reasons to transition from analog to impressions, right? Um, first of all, it is an improved accuracy, reduces remakes. My order is not like this. <laughs> mine is, okay, mine is improve accuracy, reduce remakes, elevate patient's experience because how many people love to have impressions taken, especially if you over fill those impression trays. Not many. <laughs> um, and we like to maximize our chair, chair side time and it scanning cuts down on your overhead, you know, so you're not spending as much on PVS or your impression trays. But there is a learning curve for scanning. Um, I don't know how many of you Remember when you first started scanning, how long it took you to really feel really comfortable. Um, the more that you do it, the better are you're going to be at it and the more comfortable you're going to be at it. Um, a lot of the younger ones that have gaming technology, they have that screen hand coordination where those of us that started dentistry before that to stop from looking in the mouth, to scan, to look at the screen. It was challenging. <laughs> and I know like my first few scans, I thought to myself, man, I'm terrible about this. I had sweat dripping down my back. Um, but I like to say too, if you have someone that's newer at scanning, scan themselves, scan yourself. That way, you know, how much pressure that you're placing that way, you know, if you are going to the buckle, how a lot of patients will say, oh, that hurts. You'll know what it feels like. You'll know how to verbalize. Okay. Shift your jaw to the other side so you can get on the distals of those terminal molars. So what can we scan this day and age? Um, we can scan for anything that you would send to the lab. However, if you're doing super sub G margins and if you can't see it, then neither can the scanner. Um, so in cases like that, you know, don't, don't stress yourself out and try to keep trying to scan those really deep margins because like I said, the scanner can't see it, neither can the lab, right? And then you're going to end up with an open margin. And why go digital? Because it's more comfortable and more accurate. 
it's technology driven. And we're going to talk about like the file needs and any time that you need, if you want additional training, NDX has a team for you. So we're more than willing to come to the office. Um, I like to go in all day to kind of observe lunchtime, go over everything. And then in the afternoon, watch everybody implement the techniques that they were taught. And we receive, NDX does over 3,500 scans per day. And here are your top ones that we normally see are Itero, Trios, Meta, Prime Scan, Dexas. Those ones switch all the time. Itero is our biggest one because we still have a lot of doctors out there that are that do a lot of Invisalign, right? So if you do Invisalign, Itero is the scanner that you really need. So you're not paying that extra fee for sending in files from a different scanner or analog impressions. Okay, so I'm sure everybody's familiar with Itero. And Trios has a couple different generations. There's cordless. Um, the new one, you don't have to calibrate, which is nice. Prime scan. Now you can get a prime scan. I think it's Prime Lab that is a desktop now. So you do not need that huge footprint. And then the Medit and Dexas and many others. There's, I think, a new one called Panda. Not totally sure about that one quite yet, but I heard it's coming out. And there is less steps from traditional to a digital laboratory workflow. Um, and on this slide, you can see the different steps. Um, for the first one, we really need two more steps, right? One that we take it clinically, disinfect, box up, and then send. So you have that extra few days um, travel time for shipping. And so once we receive it, the iOS department will pull up the scan and look at the margins, make sure that they can see them nice and clear. All leading iOS units are the best thing. And I think it's standard of care for scanning is retraction cord. You need to be able to see your margins. Um, there are some, if you're using a paste, you have to make sure that you're just not setting it on the sulcus, that it is going in the sulcus to displace that tissue, right? Because if you don't have it displaced, you can't read where your finish line is. And I don't know how many are aware that you can choose having a model or having modelless when you get your cases worked up. Um, I don't know how many of you really like to look at it on a model. And it's kind of, I know like in the school for the dental students, they wanted to see it, but I do know that many adjusted it on the model. And, you know, then when the patient actually came in, they over-adjusted. So then you had a insufficient contact, right? So then it was like sending it back to have a contact um, made. Some have told me that they have better luck modelists, that it just fits in really nice. So that's something that you can think of if you wanted to change to model us. Um, and here's the iOS workflow in the lab, their portal, and then they'll have their raw scan. So it's very important, right? Um, because in model form, you can see everything, um, <laughs> things that you don't want to see, right? Um, it's important that you fill, you know, like you make sure that you don't have your undercuts. And when we go further 
on the PowerPoint, I'll show you things to really look at. Um, I know that when you have it blown up, it makes us all feel like, what am I doing? Look at all those little bad areas. If it's on the clinical crown and you have some burr marks, a little bit of an undercut, please don't worry about it because they're going to start chasing and then you're going to over prep. Um, the part that you really want to make sure that you don't have are points because when it's milled, the burr can't fit on it. So sometimes you'll have rocking. So make sure that you maintain your occlusal fissure and you have more rounded edges instead of pointed edges. So here's how, look at this is margin marking area. Um, you could kind of see it. That's a little bit red right here. And then the iOS portal. Okay, so our iOS department all through the NDX labs are familiar with every single file that comes out. Um, they have this mesh mixer that can clean up a lot of the static, but when it comes to tissue on margins, we don't know how thick that tissue is. So that's why you want it nice and clean. And then the CAD, they design it and they start with, there's a whole library almost for those of that may have had the CEREC crown that used to design your own crown, how it had back when they only had a small library, but then you then critique it to the way that you want it to be. CAM is where the milling or 3D processing and printing is. And we can dry mill for certain materials, wet mill, and it shows it there. Um, and then the post-processing, sintering, fit check, that's milled, stain and glaze. If you want custom shading, like if there's hypocalcification, you can even through digital, just you can draw a picture of where you want your hypocalcifications, take a picture, and then you can upload that, email it, put it on the portal for NDX. All of our cases go through quality control. So they check to make sure what is on your Rx is exactly what you have wanted and what you wrote. Um, and as we're talking about an Rx, a lot of times people will send their scan out before finishing their Rx. And I, that's a big question I get when um, I'm going out training that, you know, I put for number 13, on the scanner 13 was zirconia, but I wanted X, Y, Z, and I don't see it on their notes on the lab end. And I'm told, oh, we put the notes in after we sent the case. Well, it's like mailing a letter in the mail and then saying, oh no, I forgot to put that. So I'm just gonna write it on a piece of paper on my table. <laughs> so, um, if you do forget to, to write something and to submit it, just call us up um, and let us know. So what makes a great scan? Um, we need, of course, proper isolation, which can be difficult when you have somebody that's heavy salivator. Um, you don't want holes in your data and you want your exposed margin. Um, me, like I said, I'm a double core technique person. I do a double zero and then a zero that has a little tail, but my double zero that is in the sulcus is first. I usually put, um, hemostatic solution on it and then I dry it 
you know, I squeeze it dry so it's impregnated. And then I pack my cord, but I make sure that the patient's nice and dry. I make sure that they're not closing down because once that saliva gets into on the retraction cord, it becomes like a wick, right? And when that gets wet, it starts swelling and then it's not doing its job. It's not able to really retract that tissue. Um, I've had some people that will put a cord in, they'll put Traxton in, have them bite on a copper cap. Um, I usually will pull the cord, um, take a micro brush with like damp a little bit just to make sure everything's clean. You want to make sure those adjacent teeth are free of plaque and I call it tooth dust from prepping because that stuff goes everywhere. <laughs> And we're going to talk about your preparations. Um, you want to make sure that you do have enough reduction for that. Um, do we have a lot of dentists on here that are still doing PFMs with like a feather edge or a, be a bevel prep? With a scanner, it is difficult to see those beveled edges. So that's pretty much the only time we'll tell you to Kind of mark your own margin if you can. Um, if you're not keeping a metal collar all the way around, remember that you also have the thickness of your porcelain. So you might have that bulbous margin with if you're not giving enough reduction. Um, and that's one other thing why I love about digital dentistry too is if you're getting those bulbous crowns, you can look around to make sure, did I get enough buckle and lingual reduction where it follows the path of the curve of speed and the buckle contours, right? So here's different little helpers to isolate. Um, there's a thing called a scan mate that's non-reflective. I'm not a fan of using a mouth mirror or anything metal because you will get scattered light and it can kind of make the scans look not so bad on our part as a clinician, but when the lab, we at the lab get it, it's it's really odd looking. It looks like, like somebody took ash and splattered it everywhere. Um, some people like to obtrigate to have everything retracted. I usually don't. Um, if if there are, are cases that you need help like that, it's usually a forehanded dentistry thing that you're going to be scanning or your assistant's going to be scanning. You're going to be um, retracting. I do like tongue depressors. I think those work really well. Um, I do like um, your I'm trying to think what it is if if you're trying to get a little bit more in the vestibule, like either your Minnesota retractor with a glove in it, um, a mirror with a glove. So there's a lot of different tips and tricks that you can use. And I do see a question real quick. Let me can a mouthful of amalgam distort the scan for occlusal guard? Now Yes, if it's not capturing it because you'll see like a hole. Um, so what I like to do, and it's not pretty in the color, right? I take articulating paper and I roll it up and I have them grind. So the blue articulating paper will dull that shine. And sometimes if you have like an all metal crown um or like in michigan we see people that have that work in automotive that come from other areas and have dentistry and it's like it looks like they have a chrome bumper on their <laughs> restorations on their teeth i will even take take it and i will just smear it um you could even use a little bit of a clude just very lightly um 
that's a mess to get off, but it does the job. The very important thing is with scanners is you don't want your overhead light. You don't want your loops on. And if you have beautiful windows, sometimes I will take two bibs and have the patient hold it up so it blocks the sun. Sometimes I kind of hold my hand over it when I'm scanning so there's less light reflecting. And so those are little tips that have helped me. So with a lot of these scanners, they have an occlusal gram to show if you have enough occlusal reduction. I've gone to some trainings that they pretty much use that and then it's like, okay, I need to reduce more. I always say, treat it like you're treating an analog impression. So you want to make sure that your reduction is done prior to scanning, right? You don't want to use that as a tool because it's one more step that you have to, like if you've had everything prepped and it's like, well, most of my occlusal, but I didn't really check it. We're going to just use the occlusal gram. We're going to erase that area, rescan. Um, the prep check is a really nice thing to check. Um, they come in different sizes, depending on which type of material you want. Um, because I come from the school, we used a ball burnisher a lot. Um, the small end is 1.5 millimeters. and But you have to make sure that you're bringing it in at the right angle. And if you have any drag, then you're just going to want to reduce a little bit more before you start scanning, if that makes sense. Some people use bite into wax and use their caliper to measure. Um, I know a lot of people say, well, I use my eyes. Sometimes that's hard when you're on number two and 15 on that um, palatal cusp, right? <laughs> See if I have another question here. Okay, so here's a case that is nice and retracted. I am really, really picky when it comes to like scanning. Yeah. There's that little piece of tissue on the mesial there that if the crown was made, you're going to have an open margin right there, right? Um, I say before you start scanning, then you're going to want to look at the adjacent teeth to make sure they're contoured nice, that you have a nice path of insertion. I didn't know whether to keep it on that screen <laughs> if she had a question on that. So like I said, best scanning practice is retraction cord. Um, everybody has their favorite cord packer. I usually like to have two different ones because one size does not fit all, especially like depending on the, the shape of the tooth, right? Because we have some teeth that are bell-shaped, some that are straight. Um, but if you have a deep margin, like let's say on the mesial, and what I usually do, put my double cord in first, that just comes perfectly together. And then I will start like mesial lingual on my cord. I'll pack it and then I'll finish off on the buckle, mesial buckle. So in a way, there's really three cords in that deep margin area. And that way, when I pull it, then it's nice and retracted. And I usually have pretty good success. But some of those cases, like I said, if you can't see it, um, you can't scan it. And each scanner has a limitation on the depth of a scanning of accuracy. Um, so I like to say if I know someone and they're kind of far away, I know they have brown eyes. I take a picture of them and it's like, oh yeah, they have brown eyes. That's so-and-so. But they put blue contacts in. 
I can't see it. It's it's that was not clear enough. Um, so sometimes you can have where it kind of looks clear, but it's not accurate because especially if somebody has bone loss and if you're doing a premolar and you're on their cuspid and that depth of from that tip of the um, cuspid is over 15 millimeters or depending on whatever scanner you have, right? So I don't know if any of you have ever said, oh my gosh, I was able to see it on the scan, but the margin was off. And then if you were to measure that, you would see that, oh my gosh, that was more like 20 millimeters instead of 17 millimeters from that cusp to your finish line. Okay, let's see that question. So like I, on this one, what depth do most scanners become unclear? It depends on which scanner you have. Um, there are some that are 17 millimeters, um, some are 15. I heard like the Medit, the newer one could be 20. So usually if you look at it in stone, and if you can see that nice, sharp, clear margin, you're good. If you look at it in stone and it looks, I almost call it like for those that used to do charcoal drawing and like if you drew a charcoal or even like a lead pencil and then then smeared it, if that's what it looks like, then that's not accurate. Does that make sense? So which scanner has your lab found to be the most accurate and forgiving? Well, that's kind of a loaded question there because I'm trying to figure out like as of accuracy, you know, everybody has like their favorite, which one comes most clear, um, you know, like the other brand ones that were on the side. It, it depends on your processor, how old it is, right? Um, if you're over scanning, you're over scanning. Um, if you're leaving holes, you're leaving holes. So if you're following your proper scanning protocol that your scanner says, then you should be fine. If that, I don't know if that's what you're trying to mean about which ones are more accurate and forgiving because all of the digital ones are very, very accurate. As I said, more accurate than PVS material. Okay, so for those of you that do use paste and you know i know like a lot of um my fellow faculty they did also and they've always had a pro uh, great success um like i told you before that make sure that you are putting the tip into the sulcus and expressing it and having enough material in there that you are displacing that tissue and the hard part with that I find with paste, depending on which kind it is, there is one out there that is very difficult to rinse off. And once we have our hemostasis where it's under control, and then you're starting to use water and air to rinse, what usually happens? Here we go again. <laughs> we have a bleeder. Um, so that's probably why I'm not that much of a fan of the core or the paste because of, you know, being a dental assistant, I want everything rinsed and we over rinse, we over dry. Um, and we assistants usually over scan because we want everything to look perfect for our doctors. So if you are getting crowns that are 
like your bites high all the time and if your assistants are scanning the not your prep tooth but other teeth or even the prep tooth depending on if you allow them to or the opposing if if you're over scanning even your prep tooth you're putting layers on layers on so then the lab's going to see that you didn't reduce enough so you could have issues sometimes with not enough occlusion. Um, if they're scanning too much on the interproximal, you're going to find yourself with open margins or open contacts. Um, if they're, like I said, scanning, if you're scanning too much on your prep, you could have a 360 open margin all the way around, if that makes sense. So here's other ways of for your retraction. Um, I know that there's a lot of doctors, one that I worked for before that we, he would laser and then I would scan. Um, that worked well, but you wanna make sure that you just follow through with the laser all the way around. You don't wanna do little scallops or else you have these little, little feelers all over the place. And then you'll see um, later in, the presentation where I have some good, bad, and ugly. Um, Rory Curtage, um, that's kind of hard with scanning. It's better if you're doing that with, with analog. Electrosurge, I know some people still use that. I am not a fan of making a temporary before scanning because how many have had issues where that temporary material has locked into <laughs> the sulcus a little bit and it's tooth colored, right? And sometimes you can get a shell on the rest of the teeth and you can't even tell. And then the patient says, oh, this came out. Then you have to scan all over again. You have to pull the temporary off. Um, so um, I like to make my provisionals after I've finished scanning. And I'm going to go look at some more questions here. Here's here's my favorite part. The good, the bad, the ugly. Okay, so this is a good scan. Good tissue retraction and clear margins. Um, and probably because I'm coming from, you know, <laughs> I've been really lucky. I've worked with really great dentists and, you know, like faculty at the dental school. And like I said, our little areas come and haunt us, right? Um, this is good, clear margins. Yes. Are there steps by the margin? Does it look a little bit of a J margin? Yes. So those things. So as far as good tissue retraction, yes. Clear margins, yes. But in a case like that, you would want to fix it because if we're putting a restoration on a J margin, then it's probably going to fracture and then you'll end up with an open margin. And it's usually on the day of delivery when they close down, then that little fine piece pops off either of the restoration or the tooth. <laughs> and this is why I said to view in monochrome because color looks really good or there's areas like, well, maybe not, but here you can see it really well. And once again, it's like you want to maintain your, your margin um, where this one on the distal buckle needs a little bit more of a chamfer or shoulder. I have a question here. Um, with a prime scan, would it be better to open another catalog in addition to biocopy upper and lower and scan just the prep and the adjacent teeth rather than the whole quad? Just asking because the quality of image decreases as more data is added. So if you want your if you have a tooth that isn't broken down and you want them to mimic 
that tooth, right? That's the only time that I would do a biocopy. Um, otherwise, I just go like after the tooth is prepped, do the prep scan, just do the whole arch, upper bite. Um, I add different libraries if it is a crown under an existing partial if that helps, because I do know like the more scans you have and you're trying to overlap in our mesh mixer on the lab and they can separate each one of those files. If you do different catalogs with the prime scan or a couple of the other scanners that have it. Um, but when you're scanning I use a lock tool a lot of times on a lot of them. So I do my, for prime scan, I will do my prep tooth and get the other two teeth real quick. And then I go on my merry way um, because I don't want that tissue to start collapsing. Um, I don't want hemo to start, if that makes sense. So, because um, like if you keep going over it, you're just layering. And here's another, the color and the stone. So if you looked at the color one, here you can argue, well, yeah, that looks like it's on the margin, but it it isn't, right? You can see it nice and sharp and clear. That's what you're trying to go for. Um, nice, clean, dry margins. And so... This one where it looks kind of foggy, that has probably saliva, um, not dried all the way. And you want to make sure like you have a nice path of insertion. And here's the other one that either had rotary curettage or with the laser. And like I said, did a little bit of a scallop. So you would want to go back in and clean that up so you can see it. A nice clean margin. And missing data. Um, this is what we see quite a bit at the lab. And it's like, okay, how can you make your restoration fit right with that? Um, missing data around the tissue of the scan bodies. and all the holes. Um, and sometimes if there's too much light scatter too, this is what you can get where it could either go ashy or like windows. And if you are ever getting a scan that looks like that, just erase it and start all over. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of, or if there's a lag when you're scanning, or if you're getting double rows of teeth, they still get glitches in it, you know, depending on like the internet was, you know, was that part of the file corrupted a little bit. Anytime that I ever have, that I've tried to correct something like this, if I overscan, then clinically, like in an office, if I've done that, it seems like there was always an issue with the restoration that we got back. So if you ever have anything odd happen, just dump that scan and start all over again and then you'll be good to go. And here is the tissue has migrated over the scan bodies and and I don't understand why they use scan bodies as a healing abutment, you know, but I, I know that this is not one of the, um, the end codes because it's not coded on it. Um, but if you have a case like that, you're not going to want to scan that. You're going to want to either send them out to have the tissue, to have the implant scan body exposed, or you can do it yourself, right? 
And like I said, this is good, bad, and ugly. Here's a Velplast partial impression that we got to make an make a Velplast partial. Can't make anything on that. <laughs> so just really watch what is being sent out. Let's see if there's any other questions. And the surgery was done still, you know, a lot of voids in the scan, a lot of holes. Um, I do want to go over if, to make sure that you're trimming away extra material, just like if you were to trim a model. There are times that you can get the bite to correlate. And when it comes to us at the lab, that it changes because just like a model, if if there's too much in the back and you can't occlude it properly, the same thing can happen. So if you had way too much information distally on the upper or the lower, trim that to make sure that your bite can come together. Or like I said, it will come together. Sometimes it might be a little bit off and it looks right on our part as a clinician, but lab part, it isn't right. And then they may call you and say, can you have them come back for a bite? And you're like, I already, it looks perfect on here. Um, that's because when it comes into our three shape, it shows it where it can't, we can trim it, but it takes longer. So it's better if you have it. And once you take a bite to make sure that that bite that you see on the screen is the exact bite that they have in their mouth on both sides. And here's one that, um, I wish we had the one in color on this one because it looked like you could see it okay um, because you see pink and white, right? And it's like, what do you mean, right? There's the margin. But this is how we at the lab see our scans um, is in stone. And if you can't see it here, and that's another thing too, is where I was talking about someone asked about how would I, how would they know if it's too deep? It's, you will see almost like a margin, but smudged. And this one is like, they did not use any retraction cord, no paste. Um, a lot of fluid was still there. So we're going to go into scanning implants. We do surgical guides. I don't know how many of you place your own implants. Thumbs up or for those who do. Because I know you do. Good. And do you use a surgical guide? Thumbs up if you do. <laughs> oh, I see a ooh face. Um, so you know how important it is to have your your surgical guide for great placement and how you can import your CBCT in. And NDX has a great, um, we have a great team that does this for your optimal placement of your, of your implants. And if you want to know more, Tracy can give you more information on that. And especially if you want to do like more all on X, um, so when we're scanning for an implant, the important information is the implant manufacturer, your scan body type, um, the platform size, if you're going to do cement or screw retained. I know that once upon a time, cement was the way to go. It went back and forth, back and forth, but because of all the issues with cement being left subgingively and your um, implants failing. Now we've gone back to screw retained, right? Um, not only do I usually put this on the lab slip in my scanner, I also will make a copy. Or if you have somebody that really doesn't know, you can put other, other, other sending 
you, the doctor or referring doctor or placement doctor's list because the oral surgeon or the periodontist will have everything they need. And then you can just scan it or take a picture of it and send it to us, right? So we have that information. Um, it's very important though, that if you are doing implants that you, before you take a scan of it, verify it with an x-ray, right? Because different implants, some are double snap. Um, you want to make sure the positioning's right. Um, because I have seen a lot of cases even going there chair side to train that, um, oh no, it's down. I don't need an x-ray. And then only to find out that it wasn't seated all the way. And that's not fun for you as the doctor, the patient, <laughs> the lab, right? Um, and there are so many different scan bodies, but make sure that it is a um, intraoral scan body because there's a scan body that is for um, the platform of the lab side. Um, but, you know, make sure that if you use OEM parts that, um, you know, where does your scan body come from? Because there are so many different implant companies out there now, as we know, right? Um, different scan bodies and one size does not fit all. And I'm sure those of you that restore these already know that, right? <laughs> so here you go. Um, OEM parts. Um, and here is an example of, if you look at number nine, here's way they thought if you look how it's placed more on the distal, but in reality, the way that it really seated was the flat part was mesial buckle. And you can look there. And if you are doing multiple implants in a row with the scan body, try to have, if you can, the flat side towards the buckle on the first one, flat side towards the lingual on the second one, on the, you know, like alternate them. Um, if you can't, if that, if they do not seat that way, you can take a little flowable and put a dot on one of them and not on the other one. That way, when you're scanning, it doesn't think that you're trying to scan the same one over and over again, because it will not, most scanners will not let you advance if it's in the same spot or if it's the same size, if that makes sense. Has anybody ever experienced that, especially like even in an edentulous area that is smooth and flat? It's like, it just will not let you go any further. <laughs> it just keeps stitching on that same spot. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> Isn't that a bad day when that try when they do that to you? <laughs> so now we're going to go into um, clinical workflows for digital dentures. Um, I am not a fan of scanning totally edentulous. Um, it's hard, and then you are pushing the tissue so you're not capturing the vestibule the way that you do. Although there's sometimes that we have to, and you can scan it as best as you can and end up maybe getting a, a custom tray, right? Um, but our NDX workflow is we like either using a reference denture, and you would use your reference denture their existing denture as their custom tray. Um, copy denture is just that. You're copying their existing denture because they love everything about it and they just want to spare. Um, and then the immediate denture. Immediate dentures are um, 
those are pretty easy to scan as long as they have enough teeth, right? Um, I will take my retractors and try to get up there, but you don't want to displace that lip too much. Um, when I'm scanning, I try to roll it a little bit um, to get for that immediate. Um, there are some scanners out there that you can go ahead and take an Elginet and then scan it and don't worry about where those teeth are because they're coming out, you know, if the scanner can't read that deeply down into where those teeth are. Um, so we are going to go through this. The denture is exact, like I said. A reference denture is um, where you're going to reline that with heavy body, light body, and you're going to treat that as your custom tray. And we're going to go through that workflow here. Um, reference copy denture is a three appointment. Um, some people are going from just two. I don't, that scares me because I would like my patients to see how everything looks first. But um, I know that quite a few are going that have been doing it for a while. They're like, yeah, they're pretty much spot on. So I'm going from scan to, to printed, right? Um, so it shows like what the lab does. So you scan it, we record their VDO, um, lab get it. They, they will do, it's um, a functional try-in and then we get, as a clinician, we'll get the fun functional try-in back and you use that. I say you treat that like you're delivering a denture. You're going to want to use your PIP paste, do all your adjustments, send it back, and then we will make you a copy of that functional try-in with the adjustments, and then you'll have your denture. And here's like a workflow of it. Um, you border mold, um, you could use rigid if you wanted to. Always, always, always use your tray adhesive because if you have, I have one right here. So if you don't and you have these little poles, it's gonna be difficult to, to scan. So what you're gonna do, take their existing denture, you are going to do heavy and light or rigid. Um, there's a couple things you're going to put it in. That way you can do your muscular movements and squishy squishies, as I call it. Um, have the patient close lightly with their existing lower denture in and then vice versa, just like if you were doing a reline. And then you're going to want to trim money excess stuff with a 15 blade to make sure that none of that material is covering the denture teeth. And then you're gonna scan it in. And the criteria for a reference denture, um, it says nothing broken. broken. Um, if a tooth is broken, it's okay. Um, if they're missing, like the large part of the palate, if it's broken, like if they bring in their denture with their lower is in two pieces, crazy glue that together and do it, that's fine. Um, I have sometimes if they broke part of the distal extension on their upper denture, I have placed a little bit of temporary composite on it and held it and cured it <laughs> because you're doing a wash in it. So there's little ways that we can work around that. Um, lately, I've been lucky enough where oh, the patient lost their lower denture and I'm there to train. 
for, you know, teach them how to do this digital workflow. And you'll see in a couple here. So here's for the reference denture, um, your clinical assessment. And like I said, if it is, if this area is broken off, if you can somehow put acrylic on it to build it and hollow it out so you can get a good PVS impression of, you know, like the reline, then you're good with that. Um, of course, I mean, if there are some bro broken areas back there, a lot of times your PVS is going to fill that in, right? So I know how I've had success. Yes, you want to make sure that the calculus is off. Just put it in, <laughs> put it in an ultrasonic, right? Clean that baby before you um, put the material in. And here's examples of border molding. And like I said, make sure that you're using your tray adhesive. Okay, so once you have done your light and heavy body, if their reference denture is, oh, like the teeth are worn, you want to open up their video, we can still do that. Um, you can use your blue mousse bite, you can add a little bit of acrylic in the back, and then you would take your bite registration in the mouth and I scan by the premolars to the anterior premolars from the anterior to get that. And then in my RX area, I say opening up the video 2.5 millimeters or whatever you want to say. But here's where I said it needs to be trimmed because trying to scan the bite like this will be impossible. It won't want to come together. So before you do the bite, you're gonna want to scan the upper and lower into your scanner. Um, I will tell you the tongue side of a denture, the palatal part, um, trying to scan it doesn't want to stitch. So I usually put, I don't know if you can, I have a slide that shows one of it, but I take flowable and I make a little snake down the center. That way the scanner catches it and it doesn't take very long. It's a very quick scan of that. Any questions so far? And here is the functional try-in. Like I said, you treat this almost like a delivery of a denture, right? The PIP paste, you check their bite, you check their midline. Um, if you want anything changed, I know that some doctors will take a Sharpie. That's fine, but like you're going to need a thin enough Sharpie. I usually just like to say, okay, I want number eight moved over, you know, half millimeter to the mesial. Um, please bring eight and nine down, however much, or you could even put composite to show where you want the length of those teeth to be. Um, if you want them shorter, then you can just remove it with an acrylic burr, just like if you were to for a denture, right? So here's where it says, you know, they want a little bit of a rotation. So this is your functional try-in. Um, I know that, you know, we promote, you know, they can try it at home over the weekend and see if there's any additional sore spots, show their loved ones. I don't know if it's because coming from clinical, but if I... If I see that, like, if I went home with something that was all one color, <laughs> hey, honey, how do my teeth look? Um, I don't know how many people would say, oh, 
oh, mom, that looks beautiful, right? Um, unless they know how to keep their mouth down. Guys usually don't show a lot of gum, but, you know, we women like, oh, <laughs> we have to show it all. Um, but scanning, when you're scanning, follow your scanning protocol for your scanner. Um, but usually I do a clues all. Then I go to the lingual, then I fill in the palatal, and then I do more of the buccal vestibule, and then I will roll into the intaglio area and then scan. If you have, like on the lower, that somebody has a sharp ridge, sometimes the scanner will not capture that. Um, do the best you can do. And when you get your functional try-in, if you need to relieve it, or if you need to even add a little wash, you can do that. And what's great about this workflow too, if you do not have a scanner, you can send in your analog impression and we can turn it into a digital workflow. Not a problem. And here's where I was saying the uh, tip to use the flowable. Um, if you're doing a copy denture, uh, this case right here, this um, patient had this denture relined already and it was broken. So it was fixed. It's a case that we're working on right now. Um, patients out of the country. So I couldn't get the functional try-in photos that I wanted for this one. Um, but as you see, doctor had a little bit of an issue with his prime scan in this little area. So we were saying, well, because it's not all the teeth are there. Um, uh, maybe a little bit of more flowable right here would have helped. Um, this one does not have a reline in it. Um, and it was very transparent. So, um, a lot of times if you're trying to scan without a, a wash inside of it, the scanner, the light wants to go through it, if that makes sense. So it does these weird steps if you don't either put a glove underneath it to block it out. And, and you know, just like if you're looking at an impression or even a temporary that's too thin. Um, if it's more transparent, yeah, use a glove. Sometimes I put wax. Or here's another tip I have is because contrast spray is pricey, right? And when I was teaching at LECOM down in Florida, um, they had all these <laughs> Dr. Scholl's Odorex. Um, because let me see if I can, can you see that? If you spray the denture down, it has zinc in it. So it has an opaque, and then it scans really easily. Um, but you still want these, the little, I call it squiggly worm on the other side of it. Um, and then you can, this rinses off so much better than um, occlude does. And occlude is expensive and that it's a mess. We all know what, if you have pink or red it get, or green, it's everywhere. It gets on the patient's face. So you want to review your case. Make sure you have your doctor's notes or your put all your notes in on how you want this. Um, check the impression. I check it in stone form, like I said, all the time. Doesn't matter what I do. I like to... As soon as I scan, I evaluate it that way. And if it is for Croner Bridge, I flip it over so I can look at it because I come from the PVS day, <laughs> days too. So I want to make sure that I have all that margin area. Um, here's the digital denture design in three shape. And that's for the try-in and... Um, we are getting so much positive feedback um, on how well these 
digital dentures work in, and I'm sure Tracy will pipe in about it too. Um, cause she gets to go, unfortunately, after I get done helping someone, then I don't see them for a while. And, you know, sometimes I'm lucky enough that the doctor will call and say, you know, this one went great, but the additional ones I never get to hear about where Tracy would, um, to appointment, immediate dent digital denture process. Like I said, that's easy. You scan or even take an impression if you don't get that. What's great about, let's say, if you're turning that immediate denture into their definitive denture, if you have that CO CoSoft liner, that scans beautifully. So let's say a patient came in and if you're going to do a reference denture and they needed some tissue conditioning for a week, put it in, bring them back, scan it in if everything feels really good. I mean, that scans beautifully, even though um, you wouldn't think it would, but it does. <laughs> And there are steps to do for retrofitting a pre-existing partial, you know, a crown underneath an existing partial. Um, depending on what scanner you have. We're having a lot of great success, Brenda. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions or they want more help or guidance, um, please know that you can reach out to me at any time or to your local lab that you're working with, Dental Art or Davis, some of the labs in the area. Um, both of them are doing these type of cases. So let it, just let us know how we can support you. Thank you, Tracy. Yes. And um, with that said, like I said, that we're, I'm still in the middle of treatment working with an area dentist. So if you don't have the confidence of doing that, and if you want me there, to help you with this process, even for like the moral support. Oh yeah, that's, we're going to do this next. Um, I'm more than happy to do that also. Um, you know, reach out to Tracy and, and then she'll get a hold of me or connect us to that. Are we ready to do for scanning a prep underneath a partial? There are a few scanners that will not let you do anything other than a pre-op and an operative scan. Um, if you have one of those scanners, then you're going to have to put make two files. File one, you're going to put Sandy Smith. Um, we're going to say it's tooth number 28. Um, you're going to scan that under file one, and it could just be scan only. It doesn't need to be for a crown. And you're going to scan that tooth before you prep it with the partial out. Um, if that tooth has like a fractured cusp, kind of build it up a little bit with composite, make sure that the partial fits. Then in your note, you're going to write file one of two crown, you know, crown's going to be under number 28 under partial. On your second file, you're going to put Sandy Smith. Um, and that's the one that you're going to hit the pre-op scan and you're going to put um, tooth number 28 under retrofitting under an existing partial um, file two of two. So after you do that, you're going to prep the tooth. And under your pre-op scan, you are going to put the partial in. You're going to scan that whole lower arch if it because we're doing 28, um, then you're going to take it out and under the prep scan, you are going to scan just the prep area. Um, 
this can be a little bit tricky because it, it's going to try to find the partial. So you want to make sure that you have enough buccal tissue that it reads it. Um, and I have examples here. So here's the upper. So down here is the tooth before it's prepped without the partial. And I was just playing around because I wanted to scan a partial because with the metal, I wanted to see if it was very reflective and it did a great job. So here is the tooth prepped with the partial in place. And as you can see where that rest seat is, and here is just of the prep. And here is the bite. Does that make sense to everyone for that one? And here is, like I said, I'm, <laughs> I guess we're going back to the digital denture part. Um, case I was doing that the patient lost her lower denture 13 years ago. So um, I was there and it was on Indian reservation and it's like, oh no, what do we do? Um, there was no time to do a custom tray, you know, base plate wax rim. So as we all know, we think on the fly. And so I said, do you guys have custom tray material here? And they're like, yes. And it's like, okay, we're going to take, let me take a lower impression. We're going to pour it up um, in stone. I'm going to pour it up in warm water. I put it in the back of my car because it was hot that day <laughs> in a rental car. So it would set up faster. Um, we made a custom tray, put a base plate on it, um, like custom tray, did the impression with the material in it, the heavy and light body. Um, so we turned that into a custom tray, removed the handle, and then put wax rims on it, <laughs> and then did the bite. So, um, so here is the virtual model. And... I was happy how my lower looked. I did that one. So I'm a, sometimes we pit ourselves on the back, right? <laughs> it's like, yes, I still have it. Um, here is the maxillary intaglio view of, and i so used to a scanner. I'm trying to turn these around so you can see in all directions, but I can't do that because it's a PowerPoint. And here is the intaglio of the lower. And here is the final design. And I was told they fit beautifully. She was very happy. Um, I wanna thank you for all your time. <music>